the homily for the Sunday of Quinquagesima. My dear friends, St. Paul today speaks to us about the virtue of charity, of which we spoke about a, a few Sundays ago. Now in the Gospel, our Lord for the first time speaks to us openly of his passion to come. He says, Behold, we are ascending to Jerusalem. It is as if the Church was solemnly announcing to us the upcoming great event of the Passion, to which we are coming closer and closer. And as we read these things, we wish to prepare our souls to make this a Lenten season that will bear fruit in us, to have us die with Christ spiritually to the world and be renewed and converted in as much as we need to be converted on this Easter season. We are preparing to do penance. And today's Mass gives me the appropriate setting to talk about an important factor in penance, which is contrition, and particularly perfect contrition. Now this word, contrition, actually means the breaking of a stone. You will remember that in my last sermon we spoke about we compare the soul of a sinner to a cement slab. And how you can, we said that you cannot plant the seed of the Word of God on that cement slab because there is no ground for it. it there's nowhere to, to take root. Contrition is the breaking of that cement. It's when you take the hammer and you break that cement. You break that stone, the stone of, of our heart. We break it by repentance from our sins. Contrition then means that we regret our sins, but we regret them because of supernatural motives, reasons that are inspired by faith, and with that we desire never to commit them again. We say supernatural motives, reasons inspired by faith, because I, I can be sorry for my sins out of natural motives, I can be sorry out of shame or out of the consequences that they bear, but contrition is based on motives such as, for example, the fear of hell, the love of God, things like that. Now, contrition can be, then, of two different kinds. You can have imperfect contrition or perfect contrition. And what makes the difference is the intention, the motives that inspire the sorrow for our sins. Imperfect contrition is, yes, inspired by supernatural motives, and it is also good, it is good, but the motives are somewhat selfish. And therefore, with imperfect contrition, charity does not come to your soul. Imperfect contrition would be, for example, when you are sorry for your sins because you don't want to go to hell, or because you dread the loss of heaven, or any other reason as such. What would be perfect contrition? Perfect contrition would be when you are sorry for your sin for motives that are selfless and supernatural. Most specifically, it is when you are sorry for your sins, even regardless of what might happen to you, just out of love of God. And this contrition, because it's out of love of God, brings with it, obviously, charity into your soul. And the love of God, which is charity, expels necessarily away sin from your soul. I want to point out how important is this doctrine and how necessary it is that, everyone's pay, that everyone pay attention to what follows and understands it properly. And I want to do that by telling a horror story. Imagine that there is a car. I hope you're not driving right now. But imagine that there is a car where there are two Catholics. One of them is well informed about his faith and the other one has been negligent to study his Catholic faith. Now both of them need to go to confession. They are not in the state of grace. They haven't been able to go to confession. As they're driving through the highway, they are, they are in the highway of four lanes, maybe, and then they suddenly realize they are about to miss their exit, which is four lanes away on the other side. Crossing through the lanes recklessly, they pass a number of semi-trucks, but when they reach the last lane, there is a semi-truck stopped in there, which they hadn't seen. There's nothing they can do, and they hit it full front. And then they get hit by other cars, and they roll down the ditch. 
both of them are dying. The one that doesn't know his faith prays to God like this. Oh God, please forgive me my sins. I don't want to go to hell. The other one, which is better informed and has been trying to lead somewhat of a good Catholic life, prays to God like this. Oh Lord, I know that I deserve hell. But at this point I am sorry for my sins. I am sorry not for the fear of hell. Not just because I am dying, but because I love you, my God. You were always good and are so good, and you don't deserve my ingratitude. I love thee, my God. Forgive me. Would any of these be able to avoid hell? My dear friends, both of these Catholics made an act of contrition, but one made an act of what is called imperfect contrition, and the other one made an act of perfect contrition. The one that was sorry for his sins, because he feared hell, did not obtain the pardon of his sins. He didn't love God. It was love of his self, and he would need to go to confession to have his sins forgiven. If the priest doesn't get to him, he might go to hell. The other one, however, if he sincerely mean, meant it, obtained, quite probably, the pardon for his sins, and if the priest doesn't get to him, there is a good chance he will save his soul, because he made an act of love of God, and he was sorry for his sins because of the love of God. He made an act of perfect contrition, and he will be saved if he was sincere and if he truly meant it. If you read attentively the act of contrition that is usually given to you for the sacrament of confession, you will realize that the prayer is formulated in order to make the penitent do an act of perfect contrition. If he really means what he says, the prayer is an actual act of perfect contrition. You just have to mean it, you have to be attentive to it. So my dear friends, if we want to put ourselves in the state of grace, and we don't have access to confession, the way to do that is to perform an act of perfect contrition. Now there are a few caveats here. The first one is this. The, the, the act of perfect contrition does not exclude the sacrament of confession. If you do that this act, and your sins are forgiven by the mercy of God, that is only with the condition that you will go to confession as soon as possible. And if you fail to do this, or if you, in your intention you are excluding going to confession about your sins, you are, you are not thinking about that or you are denying that you will, the act of perfect contrition simply doesn't take place. It doesn't exist. Because how could you tell God that you love him, and at the same time say that you don't want to abide by his commandment to confess? So the sacrament of confession is always there. The second observation I will make is this. Although it is attainable to make an act of perfect contrition, we can never know for sure if our sins have been forgiven until we go to confession. Why? Because yes, we might say the words, and yes, we might think we mean them, but only God knows if we are truly sincere, or if we are not. Only God knows if, if those words, we would really put them into practice or not. We might deceive ourselves. And so the sacrament of confession is absolutely necessary if we want to be in the state of grace and have certainty that our sins have been forgiven. At least as much certainty as we can on this earth. The third point that I must mention is this. We have to remember that the ability to do an act of perfect contrition is not in our power. It has to be given by the grace of God. And although we know God does not deny this grace, ordinarily, to one who were to abuse God's grace and mercy, this grace could be denied. And I say this because we should never presume, saying, Oh, I'll make an act of perfect contrition when I'm dying. That is calling upon God not to give us His grace. Because God gives us this grace when we are willing to please Him, 
when we are sincerely trying to save our souls. He doesn't give this grace to those who abuse His mercy and forgiveness. Who promises you that you will even have time to think when you are dying? If you have ever been in a near-death experience, you know the last thing that crosses your mind is to recite a prayer and be attentive at it. It is unusual and uncommon that a person that has habitually neglected his spiritual duties would be able to perform an intense spiritual act at a moment that is most distressful and filled with anxiety and perturbation as it is the moment of death. And so we should never leave confession for later. But rather we should go to confession as soon as possible and not trust our salvation to an act of perfect contrition, which may or may not be done properly. This doctrine is very necessary for you to save your soul. But it can also be useful to save other souls. Many of us have friends in the Novus Ordo Church or in Protestantism, and we might find ourselves in a situation where it seems that procuring their conversion is impossible. They don't even let us talk to them, perhaps. Now, we know that people cannot be saved because or through false religions or sects. But they can be saved in spite of them. We know that many of them are properly baptized. So what can we do when we have no availability to explain the faith or to try to convert them? We should instruct them in the following. That first, they at least for sure believe in the Most Holy Trinity. That they believe in our Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That God rewards the good and punishes, punishes the wicked. And they should pray to God from all their heart, say, telling Him that they want to belong to the true Church of Christ and abide by all its teachings. And we must teach them how to make an act of perfect contrition. In the case where we have no time or leisure to explain the Catholic faith further, or if the person is in no disposition for instruction, these things that I mentioned are the basic and most necessary requirements for salvation. Whether if God will give them the grace to save their souls or not, will be then depending on their inner dispositions, and depending on whether if they are able to make an act of perfect contrition and at least an act of faith in as much as is possible for them. Again, I repeat, it is not that they are saving themselves on their false religion or on their false sect. It is that they are at the last time, in as much as they can, trying to come to the Catholic Church. My dear friends, let us frequently renew then this disposition in our souls. Let us frequently tell our Lord that we are sorry for our sins, not out of fear of hell, not just because of the loss of heaven, but because we love him. And as we prepare for the meditation on his sorrowful passion, let us find in it the motives for our love. Let us cry out with the blind man from today's gospel, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.